<laughs> podium is shaky. I don't know if that's symbolic, but uh, I'll try not to tip it over. Well, I am delighted to be here, first of all. It's my first trip to Austin. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I was uh, telling Bobby, I've been uh, mercilessly, shamelessly flogging this book now for the last four months uh, in, every, in every conceivable form. And uh, between you and me, I'm getting tired of hearing myself talk and bloviate. So what I, what I would like to do is um, I'll make some remarks. But what I most look forward to uh, in uh, these kinds of groups, especially a group like this, is the uh, feedback, comments, questions. So I'm, I'm going to leave an ample amount of time for that. Um, Bobby tells me you will be a very um, active group, and I, I not only encourage that, I'm depending on it, because uh, I'm going to run out of gas here uh, before the hour is up. So um, let me just briefly, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with my background, much less read the book, but uh, it is true. Uh, I joined CIA in uh, early 1976. Uh, I had uh, graduated from law school in uh, 1972. Uh, honestly, um, I didn't want to, um, I had clerked in a couple of private law firms in summers while I was going to law school. I, I saw enough of it to convince me that that was not where I wanted to be professionally. So I, um, I, uh, so I wanted to be in public service, and so uh, my first job uh, out of law school was a job as a lawyer at the Treasury Department. Actually, uh, the uh, uh, Custom Service, which was then part of Treasury, and that was a good that was a good starting starting uh, starting job for a rookie lawyer. Um, my uh, my initial salary I'll never forget was thirteen thousand three hundred nine dollars a year, which I thought was a fortune. Uh, and um, but you know, like a lot of I suppose uh, young sort of full of themselves mid twenty somethings, um, I soon uh, I soon got restless. Uh, Treasury was uh, at least at that point uh, to me a young a kid had nothing to compare it to, but was a I found it to be a bit stultifying environment. So I, um, and I was, as I say, I was restless and I didn't, um, I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do, only that I wanted to do something different. And as luck would have it, um, around, uh, beginning in 1975, the uh, church committee, uh, which I'm sure many of you can remember um, or write about, uh, uh, came into being. And that was the committee led by, uh, former uh, Idaho senator named Frank Church, who uh, conducted this very uh, splashy uh, televised investigation into CIA. Uh, the, the church committee was actually spurred by a series of articles written by Seymour Hirsch in the New York Times in, the, in uh, 1974. This was obviously right on the cusp of the Watergate investigation. It was sort of the next big scandal. And um, as I said, a lot, of, a lot of the proceedings were televised. And this was when all the CIA adventures, misadventures, debacles of the previous 25 years were exposed for the first time. The assassination plots against Fidel Castro and others, the uh, unwitting uh, use of American citizens in drug experimentations, the opening of domestic mail coming into the United States during the Vietnam War, um, just a whole series of, of, um, of uh, you know, just mind-boggling, uh, frankly, uh, uh, kinds of activities. And I'm sitting there watching this on television uh, with the combination, I guess I was fascinated and repelled at the same time. But one thing that occurred to my 26-year-old uh, mind was, um, I wonder if CIA has lawyers. <laughs> Not an illegitimate uh, thought, given uh, what they've been doing for the previous 30 years, but, uh, but it also occurred to me, well, boy, if they don't have lawyers, I'm guessing they're going to need some now. So that's it. I mean, I knew, I knew nothing about CIA. I didn't know anyone at CIA. CIA, CIA back, if you, you, know, if you think it's a mysterious, hard to, hard to uh, 
penetrate organization now in terms of what's on the public record, you should have, you know, back in the mid-70s, there was virtually nothing. I mean, I had to look in, to, before I could even send my resume out to wherever that was, I had to look in um, Martindale Hubble to even get an address. And it was just, it's actually the address it, it has now. CIA, Washington, D.C., 20505, that's it. Uh, and I put legal department on it. I didn't know any better. So, uh, so that's how it all began in 19, uh, <clears throat> 1976. Um, uh, and that's, you know, that's basically where the uh, book begins. Now, flash forward, uh, uh, following a meteoric 30-year career, uh, uh, I ascended to the top legal position at CIA, as fate would have it, uh, right after uh, the 9-11 attacks. In those previous 25 or so years, I had been involved in, I think, what was a, you know, a series of, first of all, never-ending controversies CIA seemed to get embroiled in. Um, but nothing, uh, nothing would or had prepared me. At that point, I thought I was pretty much seen in all of the agency. Nothing uh, had prepared me for, obviously, the 9-11 attacks, but more specifically, the kinds of activities CIA would be asked, be required to uh, carry out unprecedented activities. In the, uh, in the wake of the attacks. And uh, foremost of those, of course, was, was the, um, uh, came to be known as the Enhanced Interrogation Program, or depending on one's perspective, the, the torture program of um, Al-Qaeda prisoners in the wake of 9-11. Uh, and I was, um, you know, there's no, no question about it, I was involved in that from the beginning. Uh, I was the first lawyer in the government to be, to be briefed on what, what these proposed techniques would uh, consist of. I'd never heard of waterboarding. Um, and so as the program became more controversial, as 9-11 as receded in the national memory and there was no second attack, uh, after, after all those years uh, happily living uh, under the radar, uh, I became, uh, in the post-9-11 era, a, a uh, controversial, certainly, and, and uh, in some quarters, notorious uh, public figure. Um, uh, and it, uh, it, um, it led to me, as I say, becoming, becoming uh, publicly known. Uh, President Bush formally nominated me for the general counsel, permanent general counsel position. It was a presidential appointment and Senate confirmation. In 2006, I had a, I had a raucous uh, open congressional uh, confirmation hearing. Wound up me withdrawing uh, my nomination in the face of certain uh, overwhelming defeat. Um, and then I went back the next day to my office and became the chief legal officer again and everything but title only, acting general counsel. And it was there that I stayed. Um, much to my amazement, when the Obama administration arrived in office, the new CI director, Leon Panetta, wonderful guy, uh, to my utter amazement, because I had become sort of the public poster boy for the interrogation program, which both President Obama, Kennedy Obama, candidate McCain, and incoming CI director uh, Panetta had all described as torture. I thought, you know, I thought that was, I, w I would be gone. Uh, and, you know, I was ready to go. Uh, I'd been, you know, 34 rollicking years, uh, especially those last several. So I was resigned and, and uh, looking forward to actually um, uh, say, bidding adieu without, you know, without, without a bitterness or recrimination. Leon Panetta, to my amazement, asked me to stay on until a, a new, a new uh, permanent CI uh, general counsel could be, um, could be found. And so I wound up staying for a good nine months into the Obama administration, which was you know, fascinating for me from from uh, from a number of perspectives, but and uh, which brings me to this book, um, why I decided to write it. Um, first of all, you know, I should say that 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 were it not for my role in the 9/11 years and me becoming a a public figure uh, because of it, I am confident I would never have been uh, given the opportunity to write my memoirs. 
Uh, it was something I certainly would not have contemplated a few years previously. But when the idea was first broached to me, you know, I thought about it. Uh, I didn't have, I didn't honestly have much in mind for my post-retirement years, other than I was not going to get a, I was not going to seek a full-time job again. But it did, you know, as I thought about it, it the realization dawned on me that my career, 1976 through 2009, uh, the arc of that career uh, basically was the arc of the evolution of the modern uh, CIA. I came in, uh, as I say, at the outset of the new era of congressional oversight, executive orders governing CIA activities in the mid-70s. And um, I left at the end of the, of, you know, my career was bookended really with controversies. One, one was when I arrived after the church committee, and two is when I retired after the, uh, after all of the controversy over CIA's post 9-11 activities. And in between were a number of different controversies that I was heavily involved in, ranging from Iran-Contra to the Alder Change spy debacle to the debates in the 1990s over CIA's use of so-called dirty assets. This was the a, a remnant of the William Casey wars in Central America, the Contra wars. So, um, so it, as I say, it just it occurred to me that that my career, my my um, my involvement in all of those events, for, you know, for better or worse. Uh, might serve as sort of a useful and, and actually unprecedented template for a, a living history, if you will, of the, of the modern uh, CIA. Um, it also occurred to me that, that there had been no insider account of CIA spanning that, that length of time, that, that number of years. So I thought it could be so it could be, this was all inchoate in my head, I hadn't written a word yet, but I thought it could be, um, my story could, could shed some new and uh, different kinds of uh, illumination on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the CIA from the inside. So that was a major reason I decided to do it. The other reason was I also, I also realized that it would be, at least for, for the, you know, the normal, regular American citizen would not associate a lawyer in the CIA. The idea of CIA having lawyers, that very concept, I think, safe to say, was probably alien to a lot of people. So I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, if nothing else, uh, put something down in writing. I had no idea what kind of an audience or whether anyone would be interested in it, but, so, but if nothing else, to at least establish a, a record of sort that CIA not only has lawyers, but, but counterintuitive as it may sound, lawyers have been involved from the beginning in all of CIA uh, activities. They've been heavily enmeshed in the fabric of the agency, even from the first days when I was there. So I wonder, so I thought that might be an interesting and unusual uh, uh, take on, uh, on, uh, for a book. So that's, in a nutshell, that's, um, that's how and why I decided to uh, embark on this. Um, the process of writing the book and getting, you know, getting an agent and getting a publisher, uh, you know, is, is worthy of another of another lecture. That was um, that was a, if, you know, people think that CIA and working with CIA is is a is a uh, inscrutable and baroque enterprise. Getting a book written and published about the CIA. Uh, I assure you, it was an eye opener uh, for me. So, so that, in a way, that that has been a uh, a another uh, adventure. Um, now, as I say, mo the extent that people know about me, um, uh, it is because of my role in the post 9/11 uh, era, and the book, r roughly a third of the book. Um, which I wrote chronologically, by the way. I just sat down and started, you know, I entered the CIA on January 18th, 1976. That's how I did it. I don't, you know, I'm not, I wasn't a writer or an author. I don't know how you go about doing these things. So I just started at the beginning. But the book is devoted roughly, I mean, the, 
one third, maybe a little more, but about one third of the book is devoted to my post 9-11 years, which roughly correlates to the, to the one third of my career was on post 9-11. But I also, I didn't want it to be just a post 9-11 um, memoir, um, because I had had 25, what I thought were interesting and eventful years, seen and participated in uh, you know, a number of, of uh, historical, uh, historic uh, uh, experiences. So, and so I wanted, to, I wanted to make sure that the, that, that the reader um, had some sense that, you know, that, that I, you know, that the idea was a young kid, a, a naive kid joined CIA through, through luck and, and fate uh, and some hard work, you know, managed through a long time uh, to be involved in, as I said previously, in, in the evolution, the, the modern evolution of CIA, especially in the era, a new era, where CIA became a political institution, a subject to the political fates, became a much more open institution in some respects, open voluntarily and open because of an increasing plethora of, of government leaks about CIA activities over the years. Uh, and I wanted to tell the whole story uh, as best I could. And I also wanted to make it, try to make it one in my own voice, better or worse. So what you read, I hope will correlate to what I'm sounding like now. And two, uh, that it would uh, shed some light on, on the kinds of issues that a lawyer in CIA has to face none of which I was ever exposed to in law school. Um, so that was, that basically is how I, how I approached this topic. As I say, I, I wrote chronologically. Uh, the book starts with the chapter on the tapes, uh, videotapes destruction of, of the terrorist uh, Abu Zubaydah's uh, 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 interrogation uh, while he was being subjected to the uh, waterboarding and the other uh, EITs, but by and large, it's a it's a walkthrough. It's an adventure story, and it's one I wanted to make accessible not just to lawyers or even to national security aficionados, but to you know normal regular people. And and I w I was determined to make it stories, not not arguments, not not philosophical uh, philosophical or um, academic uh, treatise, and so I hope I, I, hope I accomplished uh, at least some of that. Now, as to the, um, but I suspect I know why, why most of you are here, uh, and, and will be, is because of my role in the post-9-11 era. Um, so I will leave a lot of that to, um, to the question and comment period. Um, all well, let's just say a couple of things about that. In all of this debate about the program, about the, about the uh, waterboarding and all the rest of it, uh, for one thing, this program, as you know, ended almost five years ago. President Obama, one of his first acts in the office, issued an executive order abolishing it. So it's been history for uh, five years. I must say, yeah, you know, when I was first preached about these techniques way back in early 2002, the country, of course, was an entirely different place psychologically and politically, uh, still, you know, gripped with dread and fear that the second massive attack on the homeland, it wasn't a question of when, or it wasn't a question of if, it was going to be when. But that was, you know, that was a long time ago. We're now 12 or 13 years removed from 9-11, and, mer and mercifully and blessedly, there has not been a second major attack on the homeland. But even back then, I knew when it was first briefed to me, I'd been around CIA long enough to know that one way or the other, this program, were we to pursue it, was going to get CIA in huge trouble, unprecedented trouble. I mean, I just, I just knew that. What I didn't appreciate, and which, which uh, is remarkable to me, is is there this program, the waterboarding? As I say, it's been over for five years, but the the resonance it still has 
uh, certainly in the media and with large segments of the population, um, uh, you know, is, is, is surprising to me. Um, maybe it shouldn't have been, but, but it is. I mean, you know, we're now embroiled in the latest controversy, which is the Senate Intelligence Committee report on the program, this four-year effort by the SSCI. Um, most recently, charges and counter charges from uh, Chairman Feinstein that CIA spied on, on uh, or tried to uh, well, sp hacked into into the Senate committee's computers. CIA reporting the Senate committee to the <coughs> Department of Justice for possible criminal violations for stealing documents they should, weren't entitled to access to. Uh, Every time this program comes into public attention, remember last year with Zero Dark Thirty, the, the, the swirl of controversy on both sides and, and the passionate debate revived once again. The fact that this, whatever, whatever you know, this, this, this program seems to have an enduring grip on the American psyche, or at least large portions of it. And that, honestly, I did not I did not fully appreciate uh, at the time, and it, and you know I am I am reconciled to the fact that it's it's always going to have that. Certainly, my name will always be attached to it. I have a you know I have a fairly firm um, guess as to what the you know what will be included in the first paragraph of my obituary, for better or worse. But that is you know that is the way it is. But the fact that this program, I you know I'm, I'm just saying this neutrally, no matter what side you're on. It, it just, it's just, it's just, um, I mean, I can't think of any, any analogy to it. The, and I, I, 10 years from now, I, I suspect it'll have the same uh, impact for reasons that I'm not, you know, entirely, entirely clear about. So, um, you know, I'll tell you what, why don't I leave it there for now? If, if there, the paucity of questions, I will, I will start back up again, but as I say, you know, I'm tired of, of hearing myself talk, so let me open it up. Yes, yes, Bobby. I want to start you off by uh, mentioning that one of the most interesting parts of the book to me is when you, you give a pretty blow-by-blow -blow account of that moment in early 2002 when Abu Zubayd is in custody and personnel come to you saying, here's, here's what we think we need to do to get him talking again, and here are the particular techniques. Uh, you're the first lawyer we've come to. Can we do this? And uh, I think it's very interesting to give a description of how that unfolded. Can you, can you share with the group, uh, you know, how you responded, including how you, how you thought through it and what steps you decided to take at that point? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, as I say, the, the, if, the one thing I keep emphasizing, probably on nauseam with some people, is the context of the time. I mean, everybody, and I mean everyone, certainly in Washington uh, and in the media and in Congress. I mean, the imperative there, you know, CIA and FBI basically blown it prior to 9-11 and not uncovering and deterring the original attacks. And the opprobrium that, that we were getting about having been risk averse in the pre-9-11 era, how being so too timid, too unimaginative, too, too, too dainty to have infiltrated Al-Qaeda and deal with bad guys of the world. So that was a, that was a torrent of criticism we were getting. And, uh, uh, and a lot of it was deserved. So. So prior to 9-11, I had, as I say, never heard of waterboarding. In my, in my career, at least, the CIA had never held anyone against its will, believe it or not. Certainly no secret prisons, black sites, another, another phrase that is in the national lexicon. None of that had happened. And we had captured our first high-level terrorist, a guy named Abu Zubaydah, basically the, the travel agent for al-Qaeda. Uh, if there was, if our experts were convinced, if, if there was anybody who knew about the next attack and what was going to be happening, it was going to be this guy. Our interrogators were convinced that he was holding out, uh, that he basically said, I know what you want me to tell you, and I, I'm just not going to tell you. There's nothing I can do about it. Now, to be fair, historically, I was not aware of this at the time, but it, it, as some of you know, a couple of FBI agents uh, have come forward uh, in subsequent years to say that they had been involved in the early interrogations, and they were getting information out of Zubeda, and these techniques were not necessary. 
I never heard that at the time, but in any event, I was presented with this. I said I knew it was going to get the agency in huge trouble. And, uh, you know, I could have I stopped them. They had not left the building yet. Um, and, you know, it was, it was very tempting to do that. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time to deliberate, but ultimately, I mean, I played out the scenarios in my head the next day or two that, let's say, I, our expert that said these techniques are the ones we think are necessary to elicit the information we need. And if I had stopped them, and let's say Zubeda knew about the next attack, and there was a next attack, massive attack, you know, bodies on the streets everywhere again. And in the postmortems, it came to pass that, yes, CIA experts thought that, that he knew, and they proposed some extraordinary techniques to get the information out of him, but that CIA ultimately blinked and backed away again. As a result, their bodies all over the, another, another massive carnage. I would have known, uh, and I assume it would have come out, that, you know, that that decision and the, and the wreckage and carnage would have caused would have been my responsibility. And in the final analysis, I could not, I could not live with that scenario, having to live with that scenario. So that's what prompted me more than anything else to, you know, not enthusiastically unleash the dogs of interrogation but to seek definitive executive branch legal approval by the Department of Justice for these techniques. And if, they, if the Justice Department determined they were torture, then that would have been the end of it. But if nothing else, we would have taken this as, as far as we could have. And honestly, there was a certain degree of self-protection uh, in, in, uh, I had in my head, both for myself and also for the people, the rest of the people at CIA. So it, at a minimum, the decision would not have been made just by CIA, but collectively, and as a lawyer, to my mind, by the ultimate legal authority. So, so you know, one way or the other, we would have pursued this as far as we could. And believe me, if they had told us it was torture, it would never have happened. Sir? Do you think it would have made a difference if... Uh you and the other people had been offered the opportunity to be waterboarded themselves? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I will tell you, I was not waterboarded uh, myself. I did not volunteer for it. A couple, of the, a couple of the lawyers that worked for me who were actually working in the counterterrorism center, they did undergo waterboarding. There was one Justice Department lawyer who did. I did not. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, it's one of those what ifs. You know, honestly, I don't, you know, I mean, it was brutal. I mean, I, you know, I, the way it was described to me, it was brutal. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I can't imagine, you know, I mean, we all have our secret, I mean, our, you know, our worst, our worst physical nightmares. Simply, uh, drowning is, is right up on the top of my personal list, so. Um, I, you know, I don't think it would have, but I mean, as I say, I got to be honest with you, I didn't, I didn't, uh, 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 go through it myself. Yes, sir. What do you, as a, a nation of laws, we hope that maybe the laws are enforced equitably to some degree. Understand? What do you think about when the new administration came in and they opened up investigations on those within the CIA who carried out those those acts when they thought they were operating legally, based upon what you had done and, and DOJ had done? Now, all of a sudden, because of a change of administration, all that legal opinion seems to have been thrown out. I, I don't really understand, if I set aside the politics of it and just focus on the legal side of it, how does that happen? Well, I don't know. I mean, as I say, I, was, I had an unusual and unexpected opportunity of still being on the inside when that was done. Um, well, it was a big surprise to me, I will, I will tell you that. This, you know, and President Obama, to his credit, at the time we, he, he ended the interrogation program, two days into office, you know, he made it, he made it clear explicitly that those who've been carrying out these activities in good faith, uh, he was not interested in, in going after that. He, you know, he famously said he wanted to look forward, not backward. So I and the rest of 
career CIA people involved in the program believed that. Uh, you know, three months later, his attorney general uh, essentially reopened uh, uh, this can of worms. And uh, it was un unprecedented in, in my experience uh, uh, for that kind of, with that kind of a, a, a about face. So I will say it was, um, you know, I mean, I can't be, I can't be uh, uh, objective about this. I mean, among other things, he declassified all those what came to me known as the torture memos. You know, where lucky me, I was the addressee on every single one of them. So those all came out. But I mean, that was, an, you know, it's one thing to end the covert action program. I mean, we all knew the interrogation program was going to end, whoever won, McCain or Obama. And that was, that was okay. That was fine. But just because you end the program, you don't throw everything out the door that, that had been part of the program. So that was a big shock to me because, again, that had never been done. You know, I can't help knowing parenthetically that the Obama administration has been fighting like hell to keep its OLC opinion about when it's lawful to kill a, uh, an American citizen under wraps only until a federal appeals court judge or panel said yesterday it had to. So, I mean, every administration, you know, I'm singling out the Obama administration, but I'll tell you, it's a lot different once you're in office, the president's in office. Your perspective on things changes. So that's why this, this idea of reopening and exposing, you know, the criminal jeopardy. Uh, I mean, you know, guys like me, we could, you know, we could take care of ourselves, but the GS 12s, 13s, or 14s that were relying on assurances by people like me, with way, you know, which I, I thought these opinions were solid gold, that they would be okay, that they, you know, and, and them having to go out once again and, and hire hire lawyers to defend themselves. And honestly, I just thought it was just, well, it was clearly corrosive to CIA morale. And I think it was, uh, you know, uncalled for. So. The press has reported that we did not get any creditable information out of this waterboarding. Is that correct? Well, yeah, it's a press, but it's also, you know, the Senate Intelligence Committee report, uh, whenever it comes out, is apparently going to is, is uh, apparently going to arrive at the same conclusion. So it's not, it's not just the press, it's, it's apparently where the Senate C Intelligence Committee is going to uh, come out on it. No, I don't think it's correct. Um, we did get, you know, this program went on for six years. I was following it every day, every, every night at five o'clock with all the peer in the CIA director's office to get the updates from uh, the information and it was being collected. Yes, I thought, I thought then, and, and these were, you know, these are career CIA people. These weren't, you know, ideologues or Bush administration appointees. Yes, I think valuable uh, intelligence was gained during the course of that period by waterboarding, uh, but by also the other techniques, the less, the less controversial and less notorious techniques. You know, waterboarding, you know, keep in mind, was only performed on three detainees. Uh, CIA had, had more than 100 uh, detainees during the course of the program. 33 were subjected to EIT. So waterboarding was a, was a you know, relatively small component, but an important component. So, I, so to answer your question, yes, I was convinced during the, during the course of all those years that valuable information was being uh, obtained. Could it have been obtained, same information be obtained without having resorted to this clearly Let's say uh, clearly unprecedented in some respects, brutal kinds of kinds of uh, uh, behavior, perhaps. But I just returned to the context of the time. How long would that have taken? Uh, and the final thing I would say about that, because I have been asked that before. Uh, I mean, just I mean, just ask yourselves, why would CIA conduct a program for six years, a program that? Daily was becoming more politically controversial. That was exposing a lot of us to professional uh, uh, invest investigation and harm. Why would we continue a program that long in the face of that kind of that kind of criticism and controversy if it wasn't gaining anything? I mean, it just, it's just—it's not possible. It's—I would not have—I would not have let that program go on if, if, if I thought it was just a ruse and nothing was coming out of me. So that's what I would say about that. Yes, sir. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, 
this week, the second uh, circuit court of appeals basically said that the government has to release the legal guidelines for uh, creating killings, the targeted killings of drones on U.S. citizens abroad. And I, I just want to, I just want to get your uh, perspective on that. I guess what, what, what did the CIA tell itself that uh, that was the legal standard that it could use uh, in creating that list? And what do you think will, be, will come of that information being released? Well, um, the uh, that. Yeah, I mentioned this earlier in my, in my earlier answers, Professor Chesney. The uh, that opinion, you know, was was prepared by Officer Leo Counsel after I resigned, so I have no idea what's in it. Sure, sure. I say I found it a bit ironic the Obama administration was so zealously protecting its OLC opinions, while well, well, having previously thrown out the door of the Bush era opinions. But be that as it may, I think the I think. Um, you know, it's funny, it's, it's funny, not funny. It was always ironic to me about the drone program over the years. The drone program started about the same time the interrogation program started, in 2002. All those years, subsequent years, where the, where the interrogation program was, was you know, just, sub, you know, just such roiling emotional controversy. You know, a, a admittedly brittle program, but to interrogate and to get information from terrorists. At the same time, the drone program was already underway, in which terrorists were getting killed, I mean, blown to bits from 30,000 feet for all the world to see, sometimes innocent bystanders along the way. Never mind that, that, the, that the American citizens were being targeted, which was not done, by the way, during the time I was there. But yet, yet during all that time, there, you know, none, no one in Congress, I must say no, no human rights group or civil liberties group ever protested a program that's basically targeting people for death, while at the same time, um, uh, you know, the, the interrogation program was such, subject to such, such, uh, such criticism. I always found, you know, somehow, until relatively recently, it seemed to be the consensus political and in, in, in the media that it was more justifiably and legally defensible to kill a terrorist than it was to capture and aggressively interrogate one. And I never quite myself reconciled. Now, the effect of this opinion coming out, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's not, I mean, frankly, it's not a huge secret that, I mean, the administration, you know, or, you know, when al Awlaki, the American citizen, was killed, they, you know, they, they were not, they were not a, shy about saying that the, the, I think the president himself took personal responsibility for having made that decision. So I don't think it's going to cause any more, you know, uh, uh, controversy than, than, uh, than what, what, it's, uh, what it's done already. I honestly, I don't, I don't, you know, the drone program in some respects is still classified, so I can't, for instance, get too detailed in my own role on that over the years. Uh, but it's not like this is some huge revelation. So, I think I think the impact will be you know pretty pretty uh, limited, and you know people will basically already know what happened. So, yes, ma'am. Well, on the latter, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, yeah, I think that, I mean, that's been, you know, a lot, a lot of the criticism. And I, and also, don't forget the moral stain on the United States. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't dispute that. Uh, uh, yeah. Now, did it, as it, as it caused Al Qaeda to operate more brutally than they had been before? And that's a hard one for me, because, in his interrogation program it didn't start till several months after the 3,000 Americans were murdered. Uh, so I mean, for my money at least, Al-Qaeda was fairly brutal beforehand. I can't, you know, on the scale of things, I don't know, I don't know how much more brutal and, and, and ruthless and merciless they could have been. So, so that, 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 that criticism, uh, you know, 
I just, I just don't find, I just don't find uh, persuasive. But I mean, as I say, I won't, I won't personally. I mean, we can all speak for ourselves, but I won't gainsay the fact that this, that that the program, since exposed, is probably not, certainly not deterred people from from uh, bad people from joining Al Qaeda. Uh, you know, that's one of the that's one of the main dilemmas that made it, at the beginning of this program made it, you know, made it so vexing for a lot of us because we knew. We knew there would, you know, when it came out, and we knew, I knew at least, eventually it was going to come out. It was going to, there would be a large parts of the world that would, that would say the very things that they've said. But given the context of the times and the risks and the overriding need, in our view, to prevent another catastrophic attack, we, we decided to proceed uh, nonetheless. And I guess historians will be judging the implication of that decision forever. Yes, sir. Can you make the ultimate decision as to which techniques seem to be used and for how long? Who did? Yeah. Um, the, the particular, yeah, the, the particular techniques would, were CIA. I mean, were CIA, the operational calls were made by, were made by CIA. The, the decision to employ the techniques I mean, you know, the, basically the laundry list of techniques before it began. I've gone over the Justice Department legal rule, but it was also approved from, from a policy perspective uh, by, you know, the highest level, policy making levels of the Bush administration. And I might add, in the early years, the leadership of the Congress. The program was, this has gotten lost sometimes in, in the, in, in the uh, ensuing years, but this program, all the techniques and what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, we're told to the so-called Gang of Eight, which is basically the eight leaders of Congress beginning in 2000, well, it began when the program started in 2002. And there was, I will tell you, because I was at some of those briefings, there were, and this was bipartisan, of course, you know, leaders on both sides, you, you know, not a, not a word of concern or, or um, criticism. The only questions we're getting those, at least those first two years, was, is this enough? Is this all you're doing? Is there any, you know, are there other techniques you think would work and you don't, you know, you're shy about them because we're going to back you up? I mean, it was a direct quote. So, now as time went on, that changed. But, but in terms of, you know, I, I said that three people have been waterboarded. The decision to waterboard an individual uh, was made by uh, CIA counterterrorism people. And I was, you know, I was aware all the way. The Congress was fully aware of this when it did. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, you know, I gotta be fair here. It's not all of Congress. And that's one of the, one of the big regrets I have about this program, for which I'm, I bear some responsibility, is that we didn't tell more people in Congress about this program. I mean, I think we should have told, in retrospect, the entire 15 members of the House Intelligence C Committee and 17 on the Senate Intelligence Committee. I think I have those numbers approximately right. We should have told everyone. Uh, rather than the, the leadership. It was a, a White House decision to limit it. But at least, you know, for the leadership of Congress, I mean, I'll just tell you that there was absolutely uh, uh, no objection. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, briefly the fact that a couple of the FBI agents after, you know, after the fact have claimed that there was uh, effective, uh, technique, effective information uh, gathered, valuable, without resorting to martial mm -hmm. which makes me Think, thinking back in that time frame about uh, the, how blurry the line was and possible competition between the, the CIA and the FBI. Can you talk a little bit about that dynamic? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing, uh, it, you know, it's an interesting, interesting the FBI CIA dynamic. You know, 9 11 changed so many things, but one of the things that changed in my mind was the FBI CIA uh, dynamic. For most of my career, the FBI and the CIA were, more, you know, Jupiter and Mars, or was it Mars and Venus, whatever, whatever. Uh, I didn't meet an FBI guy until I was 15 years into my career. I mean, that's how separate they were. 9-11, you know, it's not like it was a kumbaya moment between FBI and CIA, but we both, both agents, I think, knew that if there was a, a, another catastrophic attack, you know, apart from the sheer tragedy of that, it would probably have meant the end institutionally of both our organizations. So, so we were sort of thrown together, and the relationship today is much better. As I indicated earlier, 
at the time, the decision was made to use the techniques on Zubeda. He had been, uh, I think I knew this at the time. Honestly, those days were so frenzied, I can't remember now what I knew then. But I think I was aware that he'd been jointly interrogated by FBI and CIA. Uh, when the techniques were being considered, the FBI leadership in Washington, including my counterpart at the FBI General Counsel's Office, said that the FBI, if these techniques were, were approved, they could no longer participate in the interrogation because, you know, they had, and it was understandable. The FBI has a certain rules, regulations about the kinds of interrogations it does, and it doesn't include this kind of extraordinary measure. So I understood that. But I never heard, I never heard from anyone in Washington, FBI Washington, at the time, that they thought they were making progress in the interrogation. And I, you know, I would have thought that, that and we had several meetings with high-level FBI officials. Someone would have said that at the time because I would have remembered it because it would have had an impact on me because say, it wasn't like I was eager to have the, suck the agency into this thing. So that never occurred for whatever reason. Uh, you know, the prime FBI uh, 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 sp spokesman for this, uh, this, uh, this position uh, is... Uh, a guy, a seasoned FBI uh, interrogator, um, and I never, I never heard his name at the time. I mean, I'm, you know, he's, Ali Sufan is his name, but I never heard that at the time. I would have liked to have heard it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying he's making it up, but I just, it just, I mean, when he first started saying these things years later, three years ago actually, you know, I was very puzzled because I had never heard this at the time. So that's all I can tell you on that score. Yes, sir. Can you speak about the rendition uh, specifically when it started and what you thought of the program? Yeah. Well, rendition, um, uh, I know, just, just for those, probably most of you know this already, but you know, rendition is when a, a bad guy, I mean, horribly paraphrasing this, but when there is a terrorist or other bad guy in one country that can't be, that can't be gotten by, say, the United States or normal extradition processes, a rendition is when you go in there covertly, grab them, either with or with the, with the host country being aware of it, and take them, you know, sometimes in the United States, sometimes to a third country. That's rendition. Renditions didn't start, it was not a post-9-11 phenomenon. Uh, they go back, at least in my experience, to at least the Clinton administration, where, where people who are were bad guys of various kinds had been, had been rendered, uh, as I say, mostly back to the United States. I mean, but as a principle, it even goes beyond that. I mean, Adolf Eichmann, Israel going to Argentina in 1960, snatching him and bringing him back to Israel to stand trial, that was a rendition. The, the CIA shooter, remember in 1993, the uh, Miram Mokanzi randomly shot and killed three CIA officials uh, trying to en enter the premises, en enter headquarters. He was hiding out in Pakistan, the FBI went over it. It was a rendition because the Pakistani government politically couldn't, you know, couldn't, couldn't be seen to be cooperating in extradition. So renditions were, I mean, it, it, they weren't frequently used, and they actually weren't frequently used after 9-11, but, you know, it was, and I try to get into this in the book, I mean, it's not an, it was not a new phenomenon. And I will also say that, that the Obama administration, because I was there, I can, you know, I can testify this firsthand, in that very same executive order where he abolished the interrogation program, you know, I saw that executive order the day before it was going to be issued. And, you know, the fact that he was abolishing the interrogation program was no surprise. But he also, there was also language in it, sort of inartfully crafted, that basically would have forbidden CIA from doing renditions. And so I called my counterpart at the White House, a guy named Greg Craig, a new White House counselor, I said, and this was subsequently reported in the New York Times years later, not, you know, not, not based on me, but somebody else. Uh, and it's true, but I told him, look, you're about to take us out of the rendition business. Is this what you guys want? And he said, no, no, we don't want that. We don't want that. The president doesn't want that. I said, well, if he signs this, I'm telling you, as long as I'm chief legal counsel, I can't approve any more renditions. 
So he said, hold on, hold on, hold on. So some sort of furious back and forth inside the White House, which I was not privy to. Next thing I knew, the executive order signed the next day, and I look at the language, and it's been tweaked. But it doesn't say renditions will continue. It doesn't use the word rendition. It calls them short-term transfers will be continued. Short-term transfers. <laughs> That's what they called it. So to this day, if people think that renditions have been ended, don't, they have not. The, and I'm not criticizing the administration for this, but I'm just saying it's a, it's a technique that has been long used and actually long recognized as, uh, as uh, legitimate, and it continues to be legitimate to this day. Uh, let me see if someone wasn't. Yes. So, Lori, did you speak about the, the lighter moments in CIA, maybe the 70s or 80s? Yeah. Well, I try to, I try to inject a little humor uh, now and again in the book. Um, I don't know, what, you know, I could go through several of them. Um, the one that, uh, it's interesting, and I've done this book tour, I've been all over the place, and it's interesting how different audiences uh, ask about different parts of the book. Most of the, most of the discussion has understandably been about the post-9-11 stuff, but when I was in L.A., I've been in L.A. a couple of times, uh, there was one brief, like, two-page thing in the book about CIA's relationship with Hollywood, uh, which I thought was interesting. Uh, I was actually a little surprised CIA let me talk about it in the book, but it's basically CIA for years, since I've been there, has employed the services of big-time big Hollywood actors, producers, directors to carry out intelligence activities, perfect cover. And these guys do it, one, because they're patriotic, and two, because, as I say in the book, you know, the way it was explained to me by the guy who handed our Hollywood account, that these people make a ridiculous amount of money, and they know what they do basically is ephemeral and meaningless, and so they're, so they're basically, you know, they want, they want, they want, they're sincerely patriotic, but they want a little taste of real life, life intrigue. Anyway, that's just preamble. The head of the Hollywood account came into me, this was back in the early 80s. He said, I couldn't, I couldn't give the name of the actor, but believe me, it was a big time actor. Now dead, by the way, which I, well, I thought I could use his name, but I couldn't, but he came to, came to CIA indirectly through one of his other Hollywood buddies who was working for CIA. He said, I want to help, you know, I love my country. I don't want any money. I just want to do whatever you guys want me. You want me to, you know, want me to do a voiceover pro propaganda film? I'll do that. If you, I'm making this picture in somewhere in, at that point was the Soviet Union or so. You know, if you want me to, you know, report back or you want me to talk to certain people, because one thing about Hollywood people, they have access to all these foreigners that we could never, you know, ourselves ever get to. So, we, so the Hollywood guy explained all this to me. And, uh, you know, like many times in my CIA career, people, with the spooks would come to me with an idea. And I'm listening to it. I'm saying, well, this sounds fine. Why are you telling me? I mean, why, what's the problem here? Well, then you got the kicker. You say, I don't want any money. He's adamant about that, but he... Because all he wants is the best $50,000 stash of coke we could come up with. Because <laughs> he seemed to be confident CIA could get the primo stuff. Direct quote. <laughs> and so, um, so this is the kind of stuff CIA yeah, law school doesn't prepare you for. So uh, uh, I said, no, no, no. Uh, we can't do that. He said, you know, we do know where to get some. I said, don't, don't. Uh, uh, and a long story short was the guy was, you know, the Hollywood guy was sort of crestfallen. He said, well, I guess, you know, I guess I you know, figured I'd ask anyway. I said, that's fine. And I'm told the guy, the actor, did perform services, and I was always assured it was for absolutely nothing. So, I mean, there were a number of stories like that. I mean, you know, CIA was not one, for me, one unrelenting nightmare. I mean, it was, it was uh, I mean, God help me, it was a fun place to be for a long time. Uh, yes, in the back. Yeah, I don't, you know, I had many, many lucky breaks during my career, and one of the biggest lucky breaks was that was one year I was on a sabbatical. 
And uh, had I still been the lawyer for the spies, at, which is what I was for several years, I would have been right in the middle of that. So to answer your question, it was, it was, a, it was a feckless shoot in the foot exercise for CIA to have got involved in. As, as you know, at least the part about diverting sales. First of all, you know, there's always been policy from every administration up to that point, including the Reagan administration in office, that you don't, you don't ransom, you don't ransom for, for hostages, and these are American hostages. So they give Iran, they sell Iran these missiles. And then they turn around and Ali North, who I talk about in the book, turns around and, and they, yeah, divert it to the Contras, which is absolutely illegal. And so it was, it was, you know, to me it was indefensible. Uh, and it caused, you know, another one of these controversies that the CIA got involved in, uh, of its own making, and, and it nearly brought down the institution in the late 1980s. So, I mean, my role in, my role in that affair, mercifully, was, was in the aftermath where I was a focal point between CIA and the committees investigating the Iran-Contra affair. Now, that was a fascinating experience for me. Sort of the, I think it was a turning point, really, professionally for me. It was my first involvement in a big-time Washington media spy scandal. So, so uh, you know, as I say in the book, I mean, God help me, but that was, that was you know, for the agency was a gruesome year, but for me it was, it was just absolutely fun as hell. So. Yes, sir. I did. I was required to. Yeah, yeah. I, everything I write, I wrote a couple of op eds in the last few weeks. Everything has to go to the CIA first for review. You know, would you like to know how they, how much they took out? Because that's usually the follow up question. Is that the legal department? No, it's a dip, it's a different group. It's called the Publications Review Board. Now I will say that the head of it is a lawyer. It's a lawyer I hired 20 years ago. So. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't think I got any special treatment, but the fact of the matter is they didn't take very much out. Um, uh, and, they were, and they were pretty prompt about it. Again, I, full disclosure, I also had written the rules internally at CIA about review of mans manuscripts. So I knew writing this where the lines were, so it made it easier. Yes, sir. Everybody, everybody. I mean, it's one of the, you know, they have you sign 10,000 documents signing away various rights when you join CIA. That's one. So, so it, it goes from top to, top to bottom in its lifetime. I mean, you can't, I mean, I'm, I'll have to do this for the rest of my life. Um, uh, again, you know, it's, it's one of these things I signed back when I was 28 years old. I never, you know, I had no problem with that. I didn't, you know, I had no expectation or desire. It, thought that I would ever want to write anything. Shows you how it's, in many ways, a career prog prognostication was never my long suit, so. Yes, sir. I believe in your book you say that you voted for Obama in I did. Why would you have voted for Obama knowing that he opposed so many of the techniques that you approved? Well, I mean, it wasn't like McCain was supporting them. I mean, that, <laughs> they, uh, no, I mean one way or the other, it was clear they were going to, they were going to, um, the program was going to go away. And by that point, late '08, I mean it was, you know, as far as I was concerned, that was okay with me. Uh, you know, believe it or not, I, I, I uh, there are other qualities I go for in the presidential candidate besides, besides, uh, you know, his posture towards the uh, CIA. And I, I. You know, I mean, uh, Senator McCain's, a, you know, I don't have to tell anyone about, about his, his, uh, his history, his background. I mean, it's just a national hero. But I had some dealings with him, observations about him uh, over the years. And I, I, you know, I had questions about his uh, temperament. So I opted for the new guy. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's funny. And it's all these years, you know, CIA just, and it's no fault. I mean, my whole career, every two or three years, CIA could be dependent on it to get, cause some sort of huge thing. 
I was always envious on the inside because there was NSA sitting out there in Fort Meade, Maryland. Many more employees than CIA. Much more money than CIA. And yet, yet it was us who were always getting in the storms. So, so finally, after I was gone to NSA, it was NSA's turn in the docket. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I had enough trouble keeping track of CIA programs, so, so I, I was generally aware of some of the NSA, uh, post, certainly post-9-11 surveillance uh, programs, including, including the metadata program against U.S. Uh, numbers. Um, again, it's all a question of perspective, I, and maybe I was in the inside for so long. I, I, I never had any reason to extend like, you know, had reason to, to talk, think about it. I didn't think what NSA was doing was illegal. Uh, I didn't consider spying on U.S. citizens. Uh, it was to me, from you know, my distance, a legitimate uh, and necessary post-9-11 uh, program. Again, one of the many criticisms the intelligence community got post 9-11 that, remember this failure to connect the dots, not having traced back, you know, terrorist travel to the U.S. and all that. This was taken in response to that. Um, I mean, I will say this while we're on the subject of Snowden, I, you know, people have asked me about him. Um, you know, if, in full disclosure, I don't think NSA would have, would have addressed this publicly had not Snowden done what he did. So, I mean, to that small extent, you know, he could be viewed as a whistleblower. What can't be forgotten is that he didn't just steal that stuff and expose it. He took reams and reams and reams of other stuff about U.S. US spying activities overseas against foreign governments, or against foreign targets, things that, you know, no one, I think, has ever seriously questioned that are legitimate for a spy agency to undertake. And he, and he, he just sucked it all up. So that, I've... I consider criminal and unforgivable. So. Final question. Yes, sir. I'm just finishing Bob Gates' book, and I can't wait to go through it. But one of the things that strikes me out of this tale is how disruptive the leaks are of an extreme epidemic across government. Although they don't seem to be that big a problem in uh, secret services like the CIA. What's the, in your 30 years, how has the culture come to change so that uh, people at low levels or even just feel perfectly at, at liberty to disclose secret stuff? And some <coughs> of it is just disruptive and other of it's serious. Yeah, yeah. Well, leaks have always been with us. I mean, I remember CI directors, you know, 30 years ago railing against leaks. So it's... Not a new phenomenon, but you are, you are right. I mean, it, it's, it, <coughs> it seems to have, in, in, in the last 15 years, certainly since 9-11, seems to have just increased exponentially. I mean, I think it's a variety of factors. One, again, post-9-11 reforms was to more sharing across, you know, no stovepiping, CI shares with NSA and FBI and everybody shares with state, and so it's one, you know, we have that mesh. What that means, I mean, it sounds great, and it's a worthy goal, but more people get access to information they have no right to have, need to have access to. That's why you have Bradley Manning sitting in a, a tent, in a, a private sitting in a tent in, where was it, Iraq somewhere, pulling down State Department cables from around the world. Or we have an Edward Snowden, a 29-year-old high school dropout, a contractor, and I'm an employee sitting in some, some far-out facility in Hawaii Pulling, pulling out, I mean, frankly, all I know about what he's taken is what I read. And I'm telling you, what's been disclosed, some of that stuff I was not aware of when I was at CIA. So, so I, think that's, I, I think that's part of it. And I think, um, you yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, part of it, frankly, is, is there's been so much going on in the post-9-11 era that, that there's more stuff that's sort of juicy and legal. It's legable, and, and reporters want it, and, uh, and it just isn't... In, isn't the discipline there used to be? But I mean, I'm yeah. telling you, 30 years from now there'll be leaks as well. So. The CIA has thousands of employees. How do you, you all seem to prevent that? Well, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. We had we had all of our chains in the early 90s. But I, I, you know, 
Never fear the polygraph. I mean, uh, that's a, that's a, I'll tell you, that's a deterrent, a real deterrent. But, you know, there have been leaks out of CIA, too. Anyway, I appreciate all this, and uh, uh, happy to ask, answer more questions afterward. But I enjoyed being here. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay.